from the Catholic underground. Today on the show, Eugene Guzman fools the Boffins. LeVar Burton brings back the rainbow. The Catholic Aggie mashes up the Apostles. Our picks of the week, so much more. The Catholic Underground starts now. Alrighty, uh, folks sitting around the old campfire, it is time for the Catholic Underground. We are your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 267. Yo soy Father Chris Decker. If you are listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and chat, chat, chat away in the chat room. Joining me this week, we've got uh, Father Ryan Humphreys. He's the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Nagadish, Louisiana. But he's sitting to my left, which is your right. Hello, Father. Hello, world. Also, we got Kathleen Lee. She's the incoming campus minister at St. Michael the Archangel High School in Baton Rouge. She's a fully licensed and bonded faith ninja. Hello, Kathleen. Hello, everyone. Every time I say incoming, I want to go, incoming! <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, you got a very uh, uh, quick view there because somebody's quick on the draw. Jeff Blackwell is the technical director of the CU. He's the commandant of the Jeff Star 1 near-Earth orbit satellite. Say hello, Jeff. Uh, well, hello there, fathers. <laughs> Mainly because uh, we're, we're reaching into, if you're watching us on the video feed, we're reaching deep into Jeff's history. Jeff, that's when, me. Was, this, when that's, was this photograph taken? I was about to say, uh, that's me, that's me from 1973. Wow, Jeff. Yeah, I know. Jeff, Jeff is ago. as dapper as he once was. If you're, if you're not watching us on the video feed, this is a good reason to do it, to go and see this awesome <laughs> photograph of the ever-ancient, ever-new Jeff Blackwell. Yeah, obviously, I've got a face made for radio. Ah, he's being modest. We also got <laughs> Tim the Sim, seminarian intern, our disembodied video director for the live, live stream. Uh, Tim, you can't speak, but but welcome. I think there's always a, you know, it's a thing you have to kind of haze the seminarian just a little oh, bit. Oh, absolutely. That's it's an important of, part of the human experience. That's right. This is human formation, Tim. I'm sorry. It's for your own good. <laughs> All righty. Well, we, we have to start off this week, uh, sadly, on, on low note. Uh, fathers Kenneth Walker and Joseph Tara, both of the priestly fraternity of St. Peter, were victims of a home invasion, and they were uh, critically injured. Father Walker, age 28, died, and Father Tara remains in the ICU. So what we thought we'd do at the top of the show here is, before we get to any of the frivolity that you usually know on the Catholic Underground, we would pray for, uh, for them, uh, especially also for, for their communities. And so we begin with prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, you are the giver of all good things, the giver of life, and you are the giver of the holy priesthood that we might come to walk with your Son, that we might come to know you more closely. We ask uh, for eternal rest for Father Walker. We ask for your special care uh, of Father Tara, who remains in the ICU at this time. We also pray for those who were the assailants, Lord. We pray for all those who are the victims of violence. And in any way, Lord, we ask that you would protect all of those who may be in danger, especially your priests. You are the Father of mercies, and we place all of our trust in you. And we also, Lord, ask that you would grant eternal rest to those who die in you. Our Lady, Queen of Priests, pray, pray for, for us. us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Of course, this does remind us, uh, not only in Arizona, but that nuns and priests are dying weekly around the world um, because of all manner of war and violence, but, uh, you know, Father, it's one of those things where I don't know if we in our, our very comfortable United States ever think that um, even the, an inkling of religious persecution can happen. And there is some, um, some at least thought right now that there could have been some form of religious persecution that, that uh, was the proponent for some of these, for these killings, or for this killing and injury. Well, for this killing, first, certainly, possibly. But, I mean, it, it, throughout the world, there there's targeted killing of priests and nuns. It has been for generations and centuries. You know, we can go all the way back to England in the 17th century. We can go forward to Mexico, very much closer to our own day. Yeah. And then we can go to Hitler and Stalin. And, and we, you know, the United States, we think of religious persecution as something, oh, they were mean to me, you know, or they didn't let me do exactly the way I wanted to do, or some, some police officer didn't let me have the Eucharistic procession that I wanted. Yeah. Whereas in Ethiopia, and in fact, the, the people from the Holy Land were visiting my parish today, you know, people were being viciously murdered, killed churches, 28 churches burned down in the Holy Land in the last year. Yeah. To say nothing of what's now happening in the Middle East, 
uh, as as Christians are fleeing places like Iraq, um, and they're and they're not fleeing because they want to go somewhere else. They're fleeing because they're being persecuted for their faith, and this includes their priests as well. And uh, and so one of the things that I did remember um, over the course of this week, as I've been praying for uh, for the soul of Father Walker and for Father Tara, is is how uh, beautiful the fraternity of priests is, and and how. Um, what what a great gift uh, the priesthood is to the church. And I'm not saying that just because I'm one, but uh, as we celebrated ordinations to the transitional diaconate this week, uh, a couple of weeks ago we had ordination, ordinations to the priesthood, um, how much the people recognize the the necessity of priests in the world today. Because in a real way, um, we we have the, the responsibility, but also the joy of bringing Jesus Christ to, to you. So... Uh, so make sure that you keep Father Walker, uh, his soul, in your prayers this week, as well as uh, as Father Tara, and uh, for his recovery uh, as well. One of the cool things in that story, um, and, and I, I presume it's not apocryphal, um, but, but what I've read is that Father um, Tara was able to give Father Walker um, viaticum, or, or, or uh, 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 anointing of the sick. Right. I, I would yeah. imagine not viaticum. Well, probably, I think the apostolic pardon is most likely. I mean, he may yeah. have had his oils in his cassock with him, but yeah. but he was able to say the prayers for the dying and to give him uh, what we would call the apostolic pardon. Yeah. Uh, and there, the, this, the FSSP is a more traditionally oriented order, and so they, they do have a, a, a strong sense of that in their training and yes. formation. And so it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. And in fact, in, in my diocese in Alexandria, Louisiana, we actually have what we call the Martyrs to Charity, six priests who went to Shreveport, Louisiana, when the uh, yellow fever broke out in 1873, and it kind of turns into a beautiful story where every time a new priest would arrive, the, the current priest would be on his deathbed, and he would get to say the prayers for the dying. Wow. And then a week later, you know, that person would be in the deathbed, and another priest would show up just in time, and this happened with six separate times until finally the yellow fever broke. Um, and it was an astounding story, and we called them the Martyrs to Charity because of the exact same sort of thing that Father Tare was able to do. That, that is what being Catholic is all about, is whenever our faith comes down to the wire, do you still profess Christ in everything, whether it's in your vocation as a single person, your vocation as a married person, or certainly as a priest. We thought we'd, uh, we, we'd move on a little bit to, um, a little bit more on the, the priestly fraternity of St. Peter, uh, they actually are, uh, as you said, Father, a, uh, a, a traditional order. They uh, they celebrate the the mass according to uh, Blessed John twenty third Missal, right? Right. They right. they uh, they celebrate. Uh, as far as I know, they celebrate all the sacraments in the extraordinary form, and uh, and they're really a, a beautiful, beautiful witness. And there's a great deal of, as we say, success to what they do. Uh, parishioners, uh, they're parishioners, because uh, from what I understand, they, they will come in to uh, perhaps a parish that's failing. Mm-hmm. And almost in almost every case that I've read, it's been reinvigorated. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that they do is not so much that they, they do everything differently, just that they refuse to believe that what has worked before cannot work again. Yeah. And, and so you actually, we came across an article this week from a, from a friend of Father Z's, Father Hunnick, uh, who had a great sermon in his blog about the language of what he calls the language of Christian and how we need to re-Christianize the meaning of our words. Um, because he said, you know, so often in the world today, words like sin and mercy and God and repentance and even love have been hijacked and they mean something completely different. And one of the things that that successful pastors and successful religious orders, regardless of their, their ideo- ideological perspective, have done is that they've said these words cannot simply be redefined. They have to mean what, what they Christ mean. means yeah. that they mean. And, you know, that's that's really one of those beautiful things that we as Christians and as, as lay people and as priests can do right now. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing, is this is a, a religious order that is 100% in line with the magisterium, and sometimes we can get caught up in, uh, in some of those uh, kind of faux political uh, things that we assign to those who may seem more traditional or less traditional, or the the, the T word, right? Um, but really, this is about reaching deep into the history of our church and saying this this provided for the governance, the sanctification of people for thousands of years. So, what in that treasure box can we can we unearth once again? 
Right. And and that's what seems to be working, right? Well, and, and if Christ really is the truth, as we believe he is, then there are certain parts of it that don't change. And if those things do change, then we have to look up and go, oh, wait, <laughs> something's not right. Because it's not as if, you know, we're just kind of following along with whatever works right now. It's not like new technology where we say what worked today did not work. I mean, that picture of Jeff with all those giant audio coils and stuff like that that, you know, Jeff, if you got cancer, you'd probably be able to sue uh, because <laughs> you were standing next to that gigantic thing. Uh, you know, th- unlike technology, we're working from Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And so when he says there is no greater love than that a man lay down his life for his friends, we know then that real love is about sacrifice, not the warm and fuzzies. Right. And it doesn't matter that people nowadays start saying, well, I want love to mean something different. Yeah. This is what it means. You know, it's not me figuring out, it's not us figuring out, it's Jesus telling us what it is. Yeah, and that goes completely contrary to uh, to what... Um, a lot of our society is saying these days. I mean, if all you have, to, in fact, I was doing this today. Uh, I was listening to just some of the, the the top, I guess, top forty music on one of the my satellite radio channels, and the word love, the word good, um, the word God, um, all those words appear very often in music, but they're connected to other things that don't mean anything like what the word's actually supposed to mean. Yeah. And so maybe we could uh, talk for just a few minutes on what are some of the words that get twisted by the world that we ought to recover. Are you suggesting a list? Father? I'm suggesting a list. We're going to have to have Jeff make us up one of those intros for yeah. the CU list of the week or something. Kathy, yep. there's a list coming. Are you so excited? Right? I'm so surprised. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Kathleen, number one at the top of this list is love. It's a good word. All you need is love. And that was how it started, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so oftentimes, uh, Kathleen, maybe in, in your work with, with young people, uh, uh, love often yeah. gets equated to just feeling. That's true. It's true. Yeah, but, but the notion uh, as, as Jesus presents love to us is certainly not feelings, is it? Right. Yeah, it's uh, laying down one's life for one's friends, as, as, uh, as you say, Father, mm-hmm. and as Jesus said. The, the notion of love as sacrifice, I think, is one of those things that uh, often, I think when we talk about love, especially in top 40 hits, we're talking about lust. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and remember, Pope John Paul II, Pope, John, Pope St. John Paul II, when he wrote the Theology of the Body, used a, a phrase, the law of the gift, saying that if love is about me, then something is broken. Mm-hmm. Love should always be about the other. And so if I look at love and I say, I want someone to make me happy, whether it's a sexual component or not, that's failure. It's not love. But if I look and say, I want the other to be full of joy, I want the other to flourish as a, as a person, I want the other to be saved, then I know that's authentic love. And that kind of love that's always about the other is the kind of love that Jesus talks about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, another another word in the list would be good. Uh, this is one that, that certainly even has political ramifications now, talking about common good and things of that nature. Father, uh, what are we talking about when we talk about good? Well, so often good is about a choice that apparently benefits someone right now. You know, and that's so if it's good, that means because I'm in political authority I, and I do this and I like the idea of it and it pays off in some way that's positive for me, it must be good. But in fact, good, as St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, is about how near that thing is to God. And so if something is truly good, as Jesus himself says to the, to the, the man walking by the, uh, the cart, then that thing is near unto God. It is, it is good because it is like God. Yeah. One of the ones that, uh, that even I use uh, incorrectly all the time is the notion of hope. It's a, it's a Christian virtue. It's one of the big, uh, the big cardinal virtues. And yet I, I have to admit that it's one of those things that I kind of get into the, the, the the way the world uses hope. Hope is kind of this optimism that everything's going to turn out okay, right? Uh, oh, I, I hope for the best. Well, of course we hope for the best, but hope actually necessitate, necessitates us placing ourselves within the will of another. Right. Hope is, is fundamentally about trusting in God. As the Baltimore Catechism said, tr- hope is the sure and certain trust that God will take care of all those things that are necessary for, for me to achieve my salvation. And so can God bring about good stuff in the world? Undoubtedly. But is that the same as hope? No. And in fact, that gospel of prosperity ends up being kind of a fake. Uh, in fact, this, this weekend I joked about it being a port reduction of Christianity. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a fake version of Christianity that tries to reduce it from the real evangelical power to something that fits into my tiny little head. Yeah, 
much bigger on camera, though. It's true, and, and live. You know, yeah. actually, Father Ryan does some work um, on his Skype connection to make his head a little smaller. Yes, it's it's expensive and complicated, but it's great because my head doesn't look so large. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Run it through a filter. Uh, as, uh, as as Dave in the chat room says, uh, faith is another one. In fact, that's the very next one on the list. Faith is another one that that kind of gets reduced and boiled down. Um, but that's not just kind of a hunch. Like I have faith or or a vague trust in something. But it's placing ourselves in God's hands. Uh, and that's why we don't profess our hope. We profess our faith, mm-hmm. right? Is Everything that we are as, as a Catholic, everything that we are as, as a believer in Jesus Christ, is placing ourselves uh, in providence. That's right. And, and it's also a deep understanding and, and, and a, a trust, but a trust in a very specific way that God has revealed himself and that he is not a deceiver. You know, and so when we make the profession of faith, we say all these things, and only a very few of them can be verified by science or by Scripture. Most of it really is saying, this is something God has revealed, and so this is something I believe as a choice, yeah. you know, in, in, in trust that God has, has authentically revealed himself and he's not a deceiver. Now, Kathleen, this next word may be something that, that immediately piques your interest. <laughs> Supernatural. <laughs> Why do you think it would pique my interest? Well, because it's, it's not about werewolves or vampires. What? <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but it's it's the supernatural life, uh, mm-hmm. angels in heaven. In fact, the the preface for uh, Trinity Sunday I really enjoyed. I tried to sing it, but there's a lot of theology in the preface for Trinity. So so by the last mass of the day, I just said it to make sure that I got everything right. I tell you, if you if you have if you have the ability to look up the preface for Trinity Sunday. That's your homework from the Catholic underground. It's really, really awesome. If you want good theological underpinning of what the Trinity is and who the Trinity is and how it works, the preface for today's Mass is is the way to go. But at the very end, it says, and this whole mystery of the Trinity, all the angels are singing about this all the time, and it lists all the choirs of angels, and that angels aren't just kind of this, this ethereal something that we make TV specials about, but the angels are real. Right. And the supernatural life is real. Demons are real. And the Holy Spirit and Jesus who conquer Satan and the demons are real. Mm-hmm. That's right. And this preface, this preface of the Most Holy Trinity, in the traditional Latin Mass is used every Sunday of, of ordinary time. Wow. And so you have that kind of deep, profound thing. And, and it's so important. The idea is it must be read over and over and over again because you have to meditate upon it over and over again in order to get at all that deep, profound theology. But it's, it's right, Father. It's not about werewolves and vampires. It really is about the supernatural life. Uh, Monsignor Ronald Knox used to say, I don't want to talk about the spiritual life. I want to talk about the supernatural life. Mm, indeed. Hmm. Heaven. Turns out that heaven is not the fulfillment of earthly desires. It's funny, in the Beatitudes, Jesus doesn't say that the kingdom of heaven is here on earth. Right. He says, yours is the kingdom of heaven, but he's, he's pointing you in a direction that is not of this earth, right? That's right, and it's, it's about eternal union with God. And actually, Pope again, Pope St. John Paul II had a lot to say about whether or not heaven should be considered a place. Theologically, it can be considered a place, but in terms of ordinary speech, it's more of a state of being than it is a place. Uh, you know, and, and so it's important that we not get into the idea that heaven is going to just be where I can see grandma and grandpa again and I can eat all the pecan pie I want without getting fat, although I hope <laughs> that's the case. Wouldn't that be nice? It'd be really nice. Kathleen, what is the one thing in heaven that, if indeed it is a banquet, the way that we understand banquet, you would want an unending supply of? Chicken nuggets. Really? Like, Good choice. Yeah. yeah. What, with a dip? Do you have a dip of choice? There's this barbecue sauce that they use at St. Joseph's, and they won't tell me what it is, oh. but it, mm, yes. Hmm. I think it's Sweet Baby Ray's, you know. I do love barbecue. me some Sweet Baby Ray's. That's some <laughs> yummy stuff. This portion of Catholic Underground not brought to you by. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so these are some words, but there are more. In fact, in the chat room, uh, if you join us on CatholicUnderground.tv, uh, words like Catholic, words like freedom, these are words that uh, they either mean what we make them to mean in this kind of neo-nominalistic uh, world in which we live, or we can actually go to what the gospel tells us. Because, you know, the gospel talks about freedom. The Bible does speak about what true freedom is. Jesus speaks about what true freedom is. Jesus even talks about what Catholic means, believe it or not. The word itself may not have been used until, uh, until you know, 100 or so A.D., but Jesus speaks about what these words mean. And so... Did you like that neo-nominalistic? I really did. That's a $10 word, and I'm going to award you for it. (laughs) 
You mean I can actually oh. place a sticker on myself that I earned? No, no, I'm going to buy you like a, a sandwich or something. Oh, well, I'll take I a sandwich. I thought that hey. deserved a ding at least, you know. Oh, well, you know. Thank you. There we are. Neo nominalist. Poor Father Chris. Hey, what, what about this song that yep. uh, says, well, you know, uh, that one, uh, it's been many years ago, but uh, what if God drove a bus and was a bloke like one of us or whatever? Oh, that, uh, oh yeah, Joan Osborne. Oh, yeah, that Joan was a good one. Joan Osborne. This was what, before, if a God, what if God were one of us, a slob like yeah. one of us? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Just yeah. a yeah. stranger on a bus. Oh, there that's where There's, the bus yeah. came in. Definitely. Yeah, trying to make his way home. What if God drove a bus? I would love that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I would buy a ticket. <laughs> the right. magic school bus. Uh, that's right. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, so at any rate, let's uh, take a moment this week to appreciate the gift that God gives us in the church, uh, the gift that he gives us in revealing himself as a trinity of persons. Um, we want to thank God, too, for, for our priests, and we want to keep uh, Father Kenneth Walker and his priest brothers and his family in our prayers. All right, planet Earth, you're listening to the Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. I'm Father Chris Decker. Joining me to my left, to your right, Father Ryan Humphreys. Jeff Blackwell's over in the uh, in the, the audio cave over there. In fact, the cave is so dark he doesn't have a camera this week. We've also got Kathleen Lee and Tim the Sim. You know, I should say his actual name. His name is Tim Grimes. He's one of the seminarians for the Diocese of Baton Rouge. And uh, somehow he won Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, <laughs> and he has been placed <laughs> in my parish, my parishes for the summer. So uh, he's doing really well. Um, he's getting used to the fact that uh, that I eat six times a day, and I, I still I don't think Tim has has worked up to that number yet. Uh, but Tim is uh, running the video feed, so uh, if you like it, tell him. If you don't, tell me, and I'll make sure that it goes on his evaluation. Tim didn't the video correctly. <laughs> hmm. I'm, I'll be I'll be gentle. I promise. All righty. Big news this week from the Boffins working in AI, not Adobe Illustrator, but no. artificial intelligence. Hmm. Right. Uh, a computer has sort of passed the infamous Turing test. And Father, I what is this Turing test? Okay, so Alan Turing invented a ton of really complicated math stuff, and and he was the first to use the word algorithm. For those who are nerdy enough to know what that means. Uh, it's one of the most complicated and powerful kinds of math, uh, and his his work gave us what we call neural networks, which you may or know, Father, because Mr. Data in Star Trek had That's a right. neural network. It is. It's positronic, though. Yes. And so we are, we're working at the absolute highest maximum level of a geek alert. We can... We can uh... There it is. Geek alert. So Turing argued that neural networking could one day be used to create a computer program so sophisticated it could actually trick somebody who was communicating with it into thinking it was a real boy. And so the Turing test has been the holy grail for artificial intelligence since World War II. Well, this week, a series of supercomputer programs ran the Turing test, which is very common. But one of the programs, codenamed Eugene (laughs) Goostman... Convinced 33... I don't have a sound for that. <laughs> no one does, Father. Uh, convinced 33% of the judges that it was a real 13-year-old boy. And so this is gigantic in that it's the first time that any sizable percentage of a, of a test body has been fooled or the Turing test has been passed. And so the biggest victory here is that it proves the Turing test is theoretically possible. So AI is theoretically possible. Hey, Kathleen, how does this make you feel? Uh, you know, uh, is this is this why they always ask me, like, fill out this when you're registering for something and they say, fill out this code so we know that you're a human being? Yes. Oh, okay. That's yeah, okay. Exactly. That's part of the Turing that, That's test. a very, very simple part of it, yes. Well, yeah. I'm a simple girl. But, well, my real question, <laughs> Kathleen, here is, is how would you feel if, if, in fact, you were fooled into believing a computer was an actual person? Yeah, that kind of freaks me out a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. When you start talking about robots and, and computers and... You know, passing for human beings. Mm-hmm. That's that's a little bit like taking over the world stuff. Yeah, I'm surprised that that uh, Google didn't do this first. I don't, are you freaked out a little bit, Father? Well, this is a purpose built program that's specifically designed to to, and it's very complicated and very difficult to run and requires a lot of computing power. But as we know, as this gets more and more sophisticated, this will become a simple subroutine. 
And I'll be more freaked out in about four years time when uh, the people who are trying to sell you real estate and stuff, instead of that pop-up that says you want to chat, the pop-up is a fake person Mm -hmm. who is saying, hi, I'm a bot and I'm here to sell you something. Let me answer any question you might have. Then I'll be officially freaked out and I'll have to go move out to the woods or something and start learning how to, you know, eat, live off the land. (laughs) Eat roots. and Yeah, I'll have to degrid myself or something. Yeah, I, I don't know. In fact, uh, Mike in the chat says, you know, this already sounds like the scripts read by the support people on half of the <laughs> IT support lines I call. Yeah. Well, there, there's some of that to be Thanks sure. Thanks for calling Support Soft. I can help you. If you'd like to speak to someone important, please say, speak to someone important. <sighs> speak to someone important. Okay. It sounded like you said, speak to someone important, <laughs> but I can't be sure. Yeah, that drives me crazy. Yeah, it does. It does. So, yeah. Any, anyway, uh, so to add to our paranoia, paranoia just a little bit, that would be my pen name if I ever wrote a thriller. Uh, to add to our paranoia, Google just bought the satellite imaging company named Skybox. Yeah. Skynet? What? I, I know, no, right? What, what? And if you didn't want to move out, you know, off the grid before, this might drive you out there. Skybox does what only the NSA used to do. Real-time satellite imaging. What? Yeah. Uh, mm. It's true. It's so scary. It's here. Um, Google is planning to use the tech to keep Google Maps more up-to-date. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's also likely to play a role in Google's quest to create a driverless car for everyone. I'm a little, Now, this makes me a little more paranoid than the other thing. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, uh, real-time satellite imaging. So, basically, things that... Uh, that governments pay billions of dollars to be able to do right I mean, that's what some of the drone stuff is right. doing uh skybox is doing this as a as a for-profit right yeah i i don't know well and, and this is not something brand new i mean remember that keyhole software father used to used to uh drool over you know that would be able to give you those great shots where you'd zoom out of california oh yes and zoom into london yeah i mean th- it's it's not like this is something that's brand new but it's something that is the more you put into the hands of one company right the scarier it gets because already whether you use the app Waze for your mm-hmm. driving or not yeah google maps already incorporates Waze data yeah so whether you use it or not your data is or whether you want it or not your data is being used as part of google and the more we add to that maps component the more you know, smart it gets. And when you start adding AI, whether it passes Turing test or not, it gets more and more freaky. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, there's got to be a happy medium between uh, where this is helpful and where it's, uh, dare I use the O word, oppressive. Hmm. You know, it's potentially oppressive right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it really sounds like a, a Tom Clancy novel yeah. come true here. Or yeah. David Baldacci. David he's, Baldacci? He's the new Clancy, if I may ah. say so. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah, he's got some, some very good books. Well, you know, in the times like these where paranoia is running rampant, shouldn't we all like to believe that the Reading Rainbow could come back? Ah. Yeah. You remember like the Reading a Rainbow. Of fresh air. You remember the Reading Rainbow? Yes. LeVar Burton leads you on public television talking <laughs> about all of the latest children's books and occasionally taking you on the set of of his show, Star Trek The Next Generation. Kathleen, did you ever watch The Reading Rainbow? I did. Yeah? I did. Yeah, well, I've got good news for you, Kathleen, because LeVar Burton has hopped on the Kickstarter craze, and he managed in a record amount of time, almost more of a record than the Veronica Mars movie, to make money by saying we're going to bring Reading Rainbow back. And so, Kathleen, Reading Rainbow's coming back. Yes. Yep. Oh, it's the best oh, day of my I'm life, sorry. probably. Father. It's all right. It's okay. Uh, so, so yeah, yeah that's uh, that's what we got going uh, going on here. I am excited about this as well. I I don't know. I watched a little bit of Reading Rainbow as a kid. Mm-hmm. I was actually more of a Mister Rogers fan, believe it or not. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but Reading Rainbow was a really well done series. Uh, and Father Ryan, did you watch the Reading Rainbow? I loved Reading Rainbow. I uh, moved out. I, I lived in the deep woods when I was younger. But when I came into the city. And got cityfied. Uh, that was one of the first shows I watched, and I loved watching LeVar Burton read. It was great. <laughs> David in the chat room says, <laughs> I can't stand to look at LeVar Burton's eyes. Just saying. Maybe he'll wear the visor. <laughs> I, you know. Uh, well, that's the thing. LeVar Burton does have incredibly piercing uh, dinner plate eyeballs. He does. Oh, yeah. He does. Uh, yeah. So, uh, maybe, may, well, I don't know. I guess that might be an option. You know, if you if you donate to like the the three million tier of, yeah. of Reading Rainbow, he'll wear the visor. Mm. That'd be great. 
I think I'd, I'd like that. Uh, so um, I, I think that this could be a very good thing uh, because a lot of the reboots that are happening nowadays, uh, especially in public television, are, are potentially good. The, the Sherlock reboots have been really yep. good. Of course, that came from the BBC, but mm-hmm. um, but those have been good. So so how do we feel about uh, a reboot of Reading Rainbow? Well, for me, I'm always somebody who is a big advocate of these kinds of things. But at the same time, literature is philosophy. What yeah. we read, especially as children, teaches us how to think. And so I love LeVar Burton, but if... Um, LeVar Burton chooses Polly has two daddies, yeah. uh, you know, as a text, as right. a book to read, then it could go south really fast. At the same time, if he chooses some classic, you know, kind of texts, it could be something that's truly great. Yeah. And it's just hard to say where that's going to be. And it's going to be, you're going to need some time before we can, we can guess at what the right, right one of those is going to be. Yeah. And that's uh, quite possibly one of the things that makes me worry about it is, is sometimes uh, I wonder if some of these reboots aren't, aren't becoming kind of the, the mouthpiece of what is not actually the common good, mm. what, what can work to destroy society and, and to destroy um, the notion of the family. In fact, I spoke about that in my homily today, mm. about how really if we want to understand the Trinity here on Earth, we've got to have a family unit that's functioning. Yeah. Otherwise, all of a sudden, we don't really need to look at God as Father. We don't, need to, we don't want to understand that. And we certainly don't want to talk about Jesus as a son, because all of those words, as we were saying earlier, get to be bad words. And so if, if our literature uh, begins to, to, to do that, right? Because as you say, literature is philosophy. If our literature begins to shape the way that we think, and if our literature's philosophy is flawed, then our philosophy will become flawed. So LeVar Burton... If you are watching Catholic Underground, and I, I have no reason to think that you're not, um, tread well, tread well, and, um, and, and do us proud with your rainbow of reading. So, uh, yes, in other heartwarming stories that help to allay paranoia and all of those uh, bad things, uh, Lisa Freeman, who lost her son Matthew in Afghanistan, has founded a really neat project called the Matthew Bears Project. And uh, this is is a really uh, beautiful, beautiful story, Jeff. It is indeed. And um, for and my son was in uh, in the army, but never had to really get in harm's way. So for a mom uh, whose son went to to battle and actually was a pilot, um, and he took on a pretty risky mission and lost his life, unfortunately. Well, instead of just you know uh, putting her hand in her face and, and uh, you know, and, and grieving like normal parents would, she decided to go a step further, and she started taking, like, his pieces of his old uniforms, like, for example, the pants, and making teddy bears from them, and they call this the uh, Matthew Bears Project, and you can find out more on the, uh, uh, about this on their website, uh, our, in our show notes at uh, catholicunderground.tv, yep. but it's freemanproject.org. Anyway, this thing uh, started back in 2009, and it's caught fire, and it's, it's, it's really gained a lot of momentum because I heard about this on the news, I think it was Friday. Yeah. Uh, so it's really, um, it's really caught on. And now there's just, there's just no way they can crank out enough bears, and these bears are made for the children of uh, uh, moms or dads who have been, uh, you know, who have died in Yeah, to kind of help them with some of their processing yeah. of, uh, of the death of their loved one. Now, the one thing about these bears that surprised me, these are, these are pretty large teddy bears. They're, they're handmade. Of course, like I say, the cloth comes from the uh, uniforms of the soldiers, and uh, this, this mom is sewing her heart out. So, uh, 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 but this message, and, and, and in fact, I went to the website earlier today, and it says, due to an overwhelming response, our Matthews bears, we ask uh, patients uh, while we reorganize. So it may take a few months, they're saying, but uh, they're going to respond to each request. Um, and she uses, she mentions the simplicity pattern to make the bears. But again, you know, I, I think if they made the bears even smaller, you know, you can uh, get more. Of course, that's more sewing too. But yeah. uh, no matter what, uh, these children who um, are looking for and hoping for a bear uh, made from yeah, the uh, the uniforms of their uh, dad or mom uh, they may have to yeah. wait a while. It's interesting that on the uh, on the the Freeman Project dot org uh, on the Matthew Bears part of the site uh, they cite scripture. Uh, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And this uh, to me seems like a really beautiful way to to live out that beatitude, right? To uh, to truly bring some comfort to those who mourn, and to realize that. Um, that ultimately God is the one who brings comfort for those who mourn. I mean, that's what Jesus was talking about, but that we also have the ability and, and the responsibility uh, by virtue of our baptism 
to provide comfort for the morning. And this is a neat way to do that, I think. Yeah, so uh, very, very neat. I, you know, one of the things that, that uh, I notice about the bears is that I believe this simplicity pattern is the same pattern that was used for Dr. Bashir's bear in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Come on. I you didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, well, sorry. Uh, somebody had to do it. Yes. We're surprised you're still with us. <laughs> This is Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. Yeah, we're always online, catholicunderground.com or catholicunderground.tv. I am Father Chris Decker, joined by Father Ryan Humphreys here in studio, as well as Kathleen Lee. Uh, She is, of course, uh, our licensed faith ninja. Jeff Blackwell is on the audio board. Tim, the seminarian, is uh, seminarianing his way through the video feed. So uh, very, very good. We've got a a house full, actually, uh, at the studio. We've got uh, we've got uh, Tech Man Ed over there. Yeah, and, Ed Ball, and his yeah. daughter, and Anna his... Catherine is sitting right next to me here over in the uh, audio dungeon. That's right. We got uh, we got Katie <laughs> Richard as well from Pieta Ministries, and and uh, I tell you, we've got we're gonna, the Christmas party is going to have to be, get a lot bigger. I think. Yep. Tell you what, I've got a sound system. Hey, <laughs> hey, well, let's rent a tent. What and can I've I say? got the duct tape. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now we we've already done a list. We know. But we figured that uh, that maybe before we do this next list, we do something that Jeff has spent a lot of time on, and even though it makes me blush, uh, well, Jeff, why don't we just let you speak for yourself? Hey, it's Jeff Blackwell, the production manager here at Catholic Community Radio, and here's a little Catholic Community Radio backstory. Every weekday at 7.05, you hear the Daily Gospel. Father Chris Decker actually records his gospel at his rectory in St. James Parish, and Jimmy Sagers records the gospel reflections at the Catholic Community Radio Studio at Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans. Both Father Decker and Jimmy Sagers send the files to our production studios in Baton Rouge, and it's mixed down so you hear them every morning. Now, I'll tell you, Jimmy Sagers is 99% perfect. However, Father Chris, well, let's just say he's working on it. Lifting up his eyes to heaven, Jesus heaven, lieben, flurben, sklarben, blurben. Good Monday morning, I'm Father Chris Decker, and today's gospel is taken from John. That was rather anticlimactic, wasn't it? Good Monday morning, I'm Father Chris Decker. Well, let me wait. Uh oh, this is the way it's going to go. All right, one more time. Yeah, that one's going to need a little gerrymandering up in there. You're going to have to. Open the hood and take care of that one right there. Mm-hmm. A blessed octave within. Blah, 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 blah. That was Monday the 28th. We continue our tongue-twistering tour through these tomes of scripture with Tuesday the 29th. Today's gospel is taken to us from Matthew. Is taken to us? We takes it. We locks it. We put it in a curio cabinet where everyone who visits can seize it. And we never lets it out except to go to a Star Trek convention once a year. It was like a party. Hi, I'm Father Chris Decker, Vice President of Catholic Community Radio. You know, I've seen Catholic Radio. I've seen it. And, I, and it's pretty nice, actually. You probably would want to give money to it. That's what I would do. Do you want to build a snowman? Come on, come out and play. Jeff, we never see you anymore. Come out the door, it's like you've gone away. This uh, next day, the 24th of June, is the, mom- is the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. I'm going to do the Mass during the day. During the day. Tell me, will you celebrate the Mass during the day or the Vigil? I will celebrate the Mass during the day. We used to be best buddies, but now we're not. I wish you would tell me why. When Jesus came to the territory of the Gadarenes, Gadarene, Gadarene, doo 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 Two demoniacs, demoniacs, demoniacs. You say demoniac, I say demoniac, let's call the whole thing off. Do you want to build a snowman? It doesn't have to be a snowman. Okay, bye. July 4th. Do 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 do. The end. You notice, uh, 
most of these things take place on Mondays when I'm having issues, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's that's a little peek behind the curtain at uh, the Catholic Underground and the work we do with Catholic Community Radio. And I'll tell you, Jeff does wonders, wonders with uh, with those. So gracias, as yeah. you would say. <laughs> De <Gracias>. nada, <laughs> mi amigo. So, do we want to get into this list? Do you think we can do it, Father? We've got seven minutes. I don't see why not. All right. So, the second list is a little unusual, but in a nod to history, uh, because we're 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 getting closer to um, certainly to our own celebration of independence. Right. That's coming up in just a few weeks' time. Um, but we we as Catholics have an important uh, understanding of history too, and sometimes that history happens in battle. And so, these are the five most important battles in Catholic history. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and let me say just before we get started that contrary to popular position, the church or position, or opinion rather, the church is not really pacifist, and the church is not really even anti-war. Uh, some wars must be fought, and many wars have changed the course of history for the better, but still we don't condone war, we don't relish in it, we're not excited by it. Uh, so these battles are meant to show forth the providence of God far, far more than they're meant to show forth the strength or the power of man. So we want to keep that in mind. We're not, we're not you know, afraid of, of doing what God calls to do. War is present in the Bible, but we don't get excited about it and say, yay, war, people getting shot in the face with right. bazookas. That's yeah. not good. No, it's not. Uh, so these are the wars in, essentially that, that had to be fought. Huh? Uh, right. It's a kind of a, a defensive type of situation, right? Yeah, and these are, these are the top five moments where where battles have really changed the course of history yeah. in in terms of Catholicism. So number one of five is the Battle of the Tenth of August. Not a not a great name. No. Uh, but during the French Revolution, the tenth of August, seventeen ninety two, marked the last stand of the Bourbon monarchy. The revolutionary stormed the Tuileries Palace in what is sometimes called the Alamo of Catholicism. Uh, the French Revolution saw the deaths of hundreds of priests um, and the deaths of thousands and thousands of lay Catholics. And, of course, that was also the, the, the moment we saw the Statue of Reason uh, put up and desecrating the main altar at Notre Dame Cathedral. Yeah. And so it was a horrific time. Um, and, in fact, those ideologies that destroyed the Bourbon monarchy and destroyed much of the church in that country remain alive and well today. Certain saints like John Vianney have, under, have, sh- have undermined those but those modern ideologies remain uh, present in the world, and they're continuing to do damage today. And it's worth saying that that we're talking uh, hundreds of priests, thousands of Catholics, and if you if you want to eradicate uh, something to to kind of build up from the ashes, it's always interesting throughout history how you immediately go for the jugular of culture that has come through the church. Yes, you know that's uh, the only way to do it. Yeah. So uh, another one, another good example, the Battle of Vienna. In 1683, when the Ottoman Turks attacked Vienna for the second time in two centuries, uh, it was King, uh, I believe it was John, huh? Is it Jan Sobieski? Jan Sobieski, it's a soft J, uh, of, uh, of, uh, who led the, the charge to repel them. The Holy Father called King Jan the savior of Vienna and Western European civilization. Now, uh, thankfully, ultimately, the Turks never made good on their efforts to take over the West, uh, thankfully. because yeah, that, that was the last great stand of, of the West against the Turks. And relatively uh, soon, I mean, close to our own time, 1683 was not very long ago. No. Uh, when, you, when you think about World War I, uh, the end of the Ottoman Empire in 1917, right. I mean, this was not that far back. Exactly. Um, and then, of course, uh, one of Father Ryan's favorite battles, because there's a, a really... Uh, a cool miracle attributed to it is the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. Right. This is it's one of the most famous battles in world history. The Muslim insurgency was at its height in the 1560s. Many in the West, including the papal court, uh, were sure that there was almost no hope of repelling them. Uh, and the Holy Father himself promised to the Blessed Virgin that he would honor her if she would somehow save the day. And so 1571, a last-ditch, ragtag army uh, made up of Italians, Spaniards, and the Knights of Malta. What a crowd. Yeah. Uh, get together, and they sail against the uh, the Muslim fleet, and for no reason we can tell, they utterly rout them. Now, 
The miracle Father Chris talked about is a dramatic change of weather and uh, an appearance, some said, of the Blessed Virgin in the sky that absolutely terrified everybody, and the wind all changed around, and suddenly the Muslims who had, had seemed like they were going to win the day began to fall in vast numbers. And, of course, when the Pope saw what happened, he declared that Our Lady was Queen of Victory, and he established the Feast of the Most Holy Rosary. Our Lady of the Most Holy Rosary celebrated October 6th, and uh, which is one of the more common names of, of churches and chapels now, Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. And uh, so a beautiful day, uh, a day of, of battle, but, uh, but a beautiful day of God's providence back in 1571. And if you've never been to the Our Lady of Victory Shrine up in Lackawanna, New York, I would highly recommend going. Uh, in fact, if I'm wrong, Father Ryan, then you can bop me on the head, but wasn't the, the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary originally Our Lady of Victory? It was. It was, yeah. Uh, really, it's kind of a cool notion, Our Lady of Victory, too, and, yeah. and really it is the Rosary that can bring about spiritual victory through her intercession. So Amen. It's all part and parcel. Uh, and then let's see, we, we move on to uh, the, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in 312. Uh, and, of course, the story is, is really well known. The night before a great battle, the pagan emperor Constantine had a dream in which he saw his soldiers carrying shields with an odd image. Uh, two Greek letter, letters, the, the, the key and the rho, uh, or chi, I think is the way some people say, uh, were superimposed on it. Uh, we know them very well today as the PX. <laughs> uh, he knew that he would be victorious if he had this image painted on the soldier's shields. He did so, and soon after, Constantine legalized Christianity. Now, there's another version of the story, right? Right. The other version, and it could be the same one, an extension of it, during the battle, Constantine looks up and sees a great image of the, of the cross in the sky, and he hears the words, in oc signo vinces, in this sign you will conquer. And so in a great coincidence, because uh, it is a coincidence, mm -hmm. the first three letters, when you capitalize of Jesus' name, are I, H, it's actually E for Yeda, mm -hmm. uh, but I, H, and S. And if you look in the Roman alphabet, I, H, S, in oc signo. And so you have this delightful coincidence. And in fact, I, H, S is still one of the most common signs and symbols that is seen oftentimes associated with the Cairo on vestments and on all kinds of decorations in the church. So it, it remains to this day. That's right. Even Pope Francis of coat of arms, because of course the, the Jesuits, their symbol is a sunburst with the in hoc signo uh, mm -hmm. on it. So uh, very good. And then the final battle in our big giant list here is the em the uh, embassy of Leo the Great in 451. Now, uh, in the 5th century, the scariest person in the world was uh, was Attila the Hun. And I mean, just if you've if you've watched Mulan, Kathleen, yeah. Yeah. you know that Attila was nothing to yeah. Yeah, he wasn't just plowing fields. He was yeah. actually a hunt. Uh, he was unstoppable. He was taking over everything. And when, after an insult from the Roman emperor, Attila set his sights on Rome, it was Pope Leo the Great who met him outside the city and convinced the great warrior to leave that city in peace. Uh, sadly, the Pope wasn't able to convince the Vandals from sacking the city, but he did convince them not to uh, to rape and kill all the inhabitants of Rome, which is was pretty standard for when you would sack a city and take all yeah. the treasure. You'd uh, you basically um, treat everybody as an object. Um, but uh, but Attila the Hun uh, may may well have uh, have deserved his moniker, but also the Pope Leo the Great in 451. So those are some of the the, the great battles. Uh, maybe. You folks in the chat room uh, would like to, to let us know what some of the great battles maybe we left out. Backchat at catholicunderground.com is the way to go. Well, we have gone pretty far afield, a <laughs> battlefield, if you will. And now it's time for the CU Pick of the Week. Whew, this is the fastest hour in Catholic podcasting, if I may say so. And uh, Kathleen, I think you have won chat roulette no no you've won uh, back chat roulette today <laughs> <laughs> pick of the week yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. go for it so if you've ever watched a tv show and thought hmm that is a really cool blouse i know father chris thinks that all the totally time. um and you thought man i wish i knew where to get that well my friends yes. there might be some help for you if you go to worn on tv.net no. yes WarnOnTV.net, perhaps you watch The Big Bang Theory or um, Bones <laughs> or there's a couple more, uh, Doctor Who or Sherlock. From or Melissa and Joey, that timeless classic. Per oh, I was trying to go with the, you know, nerd alert, but that's okay. Um, oh, I see. <laughs> you can 
click by episode or by character and you can find either exact matches or very similar matches to what they wear on TV. This is all girls. What about the same pair of faded blue jeans and white t-shirt that all the guys wear on all yeah. these shows? Well, Where can I get those? <laughs> Urban you <know>? Outfitters. Yes. <laughs> Always. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, this arrow, might be <laughs> exact match found. Yeah. See, I've been I've been catching up on Arrow. And so Such a good show. I know. Oh, so yeah. the whole ensemble is here. Yeah. You can get it. Exact match. Oh, wait, Sherlock has some dude dude outfits. There you go. Oh, they just look like girl outfits. Wow, yeah, it's Sherlock. Yeah. At some point, uh, jeans, when they get wearing to be tight. I mean, really, he's wearing fur, honestly. But anyway. Yeah. You can go in there. That's, a, can... that's a cool site. Yeah. Though. It is a great idea. You know, and I, I assembled upon it because in the new Hunger Games, Katniss Indeed. wears this cowl yeah. thing. Yeah. Like, half sweater, and I want it really bad. So if you know where to get it, these don't do movies. It just does TV shows. But if you know where to For get now. it, you email me, Kathleen at CatholicUnderground.com. That's a weird waistcoat. I'm not wearing that. All right. Uh, <laughs> Je- <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, what is your pick of the week? Mine is so important, it's going to change the human race. Oh, uh, another now, one. This is one of these that if you've got the time, fine. It's a free app, and I love it. ExtremeForklifting.com. <laughs> I yeah. might need a moment with that title, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> it is it's a fun little game and it's just something to while away the the time and I was I was kind of like in a zone Saturday morning and uh, I found this uh, in fact an audio friend of mine said he works at a bigger company where they have uh, you know like these line array systems that have they have to be moved with forklifts and so uh, he had to get certified and he said and as a matter of fact since I had to get certified I found this extreme forklifting game uh, to kind of, you know, help him out. but uh, Drive forklifts, lift pallets, <laughs> deliver pallets to their destination. Make cash. Oh, and the pallets even talk. They say, put me down, put me yeah. down. Oh, <laughs> Shut up, you pallet. You're just made of wood. <laughs> so, that's up, enough. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome, Jeff. I'll go back to my place here. No, this is great because, you know, I, I was thinking about it How today. Cool is this? Tim the Sim can tell you that, uh, that all work and no play huh, mm-hmm. uh, makes for a pretty dangerous situation, <laughs> pastorally speaking. Uh, and so, yeah, games are important, especially innocuous games like this where, yeah. you know, you're not, uh, you're not blowing... The, the face off of a zombie or oh, something. Oh, right, right. You know? and, and, look, the fun thing about this is if you if you goof up, uh, it, it has a reset, and, you know, so you don't have to start over from the beginning. And yeah. You know, you know, you know no, no time limits. You're not worried about um, beating other, somebody other's score or something. It's just hey, fun. Hey, good, it good, just clean, fun. appified fun. Just for fun. Yeah. All right, uh, Father Ryan, you have a <laughs> – your pick of the week is all wet. My pick of the week is entirely superfluous. It has no value to anyone. It's just 16 pictures of amazing pools. If you happen to be a billionaire, uh, there's no value. First of all, donate to Catholic Underground. Yeah, if you if you want to make me a billionaire by installing one of these, you know, multi million dollar pools, you just let me know. (laughs) But uh, but no, it's just it's a web page with 16 amazing pictures of ridiculously amazing pools that I would love to have. And that's all. So oh. just go look at it, enjoy it. If you feel like you need to go to confession after, then go do that. But it's they're so pretty. There's one on here that is that is basically a pool that has a house in the middle of it. Yeah, <laughs> and know, it's it's like the house was. Ah, eh, we'll put a house. Yeah. And then there's another one where there's this giant pool inside, and you have like this living room area, and you just kind of wander off into the pool. It's awesome. So if you want to give one of these to me, you let me know. But otherwise, just go enjoy them. They're they're pretty. Yeah, and, and you know, beauty is important. We've got to appreciate beauty, even if it's a pool. Oh yeah, it's pretty. I'm pretty sure one of these was in Ocean's Thirteen. Probably. Yeah. There's some that are scary. There's actually, uh, it's like a hotel and has individual pools in the balcony, but you're on the edge oh, and it's yeah. a glass edge. So like, if you're swimming and you Ooh. jump in too hard and it breaks off, you're going to actually fall down to your crushing horrific death. That's and right. And so that'd be a little frightening, <laughs> you know. So there's it that. It would. That it would. It would. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, guys. so I guess that leads to my pick of the week. Uh, my pick of the week is comicbookplus.com. Now, comicbookplus.com has all of the comics, or not all of them, but a good number of comics that have passed into the public domain, including some really cool ones from the heyday of the Catholic uh, Confraternity of Christian Doctrine uh, group, who put out uh, Treasure Chest of Fun and Fact. This was given to uh, to primary school and uh, probably high school kids uh, as part of their, their CCD training. And it was a comic book, but inside the comic book were all sorts of really neat stories, like the history of football. Um, they also had some serial series, like Chuck White, who was uh, 
the the son of uh, of a laborer who goes to a steel town and should he fall in with the bad gang or should he fall in with the good group at the boys school where uh, his father is uh, is bringing him to work so uh, also chuck yeah. white was a rock jock from the 60s but. oh is that right well maybe he read treasure chest of fun and fact i don't know and then of course father ryan's favorite sky pilot fighting missionary of the far north available bam, for bam, 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 yeah. bam. Exciting Northwoods adventure with Lumber Pirates. So if you want to read some of these, you can do so for free. And uh, that's at comicbookplus.com. That is my pick of the week. Let us know what your picks of the week are. Backchat at catholicunderground.com is a way to do it. And Jeff, we always thank those who help us. Indeed we do. And portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. That's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's right. And if you are patronizing our website, just kind of surfing around, one of the buttons you may want to consider clicking is the one that says Donate. Um, You can go onto our website and you can make a recurring subscription type donation or you can make a one-time donation. And let me tell you, that helps us out because right now you're noticing that all we have with Jeff, uh, if you're watching the video feed, is a picture. Just a picture. There it is. And, uh, I'm from 1973, I'm from, from 1973, we, we had to do a lot of photo retouching to get it to look just right. But, uh, but that's because all three of our cameras are in use. And so uh, whenever you donate, whenever you give to Catholic Underground, I promise you that everything that you donate goes right back into the technology uh, that we purchased for, for this show. And I got to say, it's actually really cool to see these three cameras here. Just, it is very exciting. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, so help us out. They're also not the really expensive cameras either. They're the ones that just do the job. Uh, so consider it. CatholicUnderground.com. You know the button to click. And uh, all right. Well, whew, if you want the portions of the show, if you want the, the, the show notes, Jeff always is wondering about the show notes and how to get those. Well, yeah, Jeff, where do we find those, Father? If you go to CatholicUnderground.com, you'll see a listing of all of the recent programs. And then if you click on that, then you'll be able to get to the show notes, which is everything that we've talked about um, one of these days, we might actually uh, annotate our YouTube videos and put uh, the show note uh, link timestamp in the show in the, uh, the YouTube video. And this might be a good time to remind people that the show notes are there. But if you if you see something that's missing, or if you see a way that we could improve those show notes, yeah, let us know because I mean the method we're using a blog post is the same method that was used almost ten years ago for uh, for posts, and so it's it's worth looking at. If if you have ideas for change, you let us know. Yeah, uh, we're always looking for that. So, all right. Uh, if you want to find out ways to get in touch with us on the, the Twitters, on the Face Face, uh, you can do so. Facebook.com slash Catholic Underground or Twitter.com slash Catholic Underground. Really, you can get all that on our website at Catholic Underground. Do you keep us up on updated on Plurk, Father? You know, Plurk... <laughs> Plurk is kind of like Chernobyl. I think people have built a big, giant <laughs> dome over it and hope that we forget what it is. I've been know? saying it. I've been saying it for years. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at Fr Humphreys on the Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan, for joining us in person. It's been my pleasure. Yes, indeed. Uh, I think Kathleen would probably agree that we shouldn't do this very often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kathleen Lee is the Faith Ninja at Kathleen Y-A-B-R. Thank you, Kathleen. Anytime. And happy Father's Day. Yes. Thank yes. you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Jeff Blackwell is the tech director for the CU. He's the despot at the Blackwell Communications Group. JeffBlackwell.us and Jeff Blackwell us on Twitter. Thank you, Jeff, very much. It is an honor and privilege, Father. That's right. Ed Ball's on the ball with all the cameras and everything. We have to mention him. Tim the Sem is the seminarian in charge of our video feed, and he always divides by the least common denominator. You know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. Follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Join us on the interwebs for CatholicUnderground.tv for everything from the CU. Thank you for tuning in, for hanging out with us on the digital continent. We are CatholicUnderground.com. We are Faith Gone Digital, and my friends, we will see you next time. From the Catholic Underground.